You left Tofino, one of the most picturesque, westernmost points in Canada, to s basically trick your way into China. What, what was the reason that you decided to do that? Well, a number of years ago, um, a friend of mine told me about uh, a Russian spy who had gone to China 100 years ago. And uh, it was at a time when China was modernizing, reforming itself. It was building a new military, setting up modern factories, trade with the West was exploding. Uh, there were new sort of uh, freedoms of newspapers and uh, education reform and growing pop uh, uh, public education in China. And when I read this uh, journal of this Russian spy, it sounded an awful lot like China today. That was 100 years that ago. That was 100 years ago. He went from 1906 to 1908. His uh, name was Gustav Mannerheim. So I read this journal and I was quite uh, struck by the parallels between now and then. So I decided to uh, head off on the Silk Road to China and take a look at the rise of China today and compare it to the rise of China 100 years ago. And they had no interest at all in letting you in. The consulate found out what you were up to and said, no, don't give them a visa. Yeah, I was quite surprised. I mean, I also traveled through Central Asia, you know, these kind of crazy crackpot di dictatorships like Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. And I actually got visas to travel in those countries, but uh, I was barred from visiting China. And I later sort of figured out that I had probably come across some sort of uh, agent or mole of the Chinese government while interviewing people in Vancouver, uh, Falun Gong activists, uh, other you know, democratic activists from, the, from China. And so I was barred from, from going to China. So uh, I applied for a visa multiple times in Vancouver and London, England, uh, and was, uh, was banned. How'd you get in? Well, um, I have a, a second passport because my father is uh, Estonian Canadian, so uh, I was able to get get into China through uh, through a, a second identity, I guess. <laughs> Your intent was to find out what was going on. We have this um, Chinese ad adaptation of our enterprise system. We would call it free enterprise system. Theirs is a highly controlled free enterprise system, but without the freedoms in society that we have. There seems to be enormous wealth in the hands of a very few in China, and we get the impression, at least here, that the population at large is being used by these people to amass this tremendous wealth for themselves. Is that a simplistic view of what is happening there? Um, I wouldn't say it's simplistic. I mean, that's certainly true. Uh, you know, it's perhaps a bit more a bit more complex. I mean, the, the Communist Party is is certainly gaining a tremendous amount of wealth. Most of the millionaires and billionaires, in fact, in China are fairly tied, closely tied to the Trump, uh, Communist Party. And while there is certain free enterprise in some of the coastal cities, the areas that I went uh, in, in China, more central China and northern China, a lot more rural, uh, you know, the state still plays a huge role in the economy, whether it's setting up, you know, economic development zones, export processing zones, uh, whether, um, you know, running state enterprises. I went through a number of towns. Uh, this one town called Taiyuan, uh, they have a, the Taiyuan Steel, uh, Iron and Steel Company, 40,000 employees, and their uh, revenues are larger than the GDP of Kyrgyzstan, and it's all basically government run. Government run and the revenues flowing to what and whom? Well, the what revenues flowing uh, in one case in another steel town. You know, uh, I was told that the local CEO of the state-owned enterprise drove around town in a Ferrari. So there are certain there's certainly growing economic uh, wealth disparity in China, and actually that's concerning the the, communi the communist party. Uh, you know, I think they can ma maintain sort of social stability in China, though, partly because everybody's income you know is growing that uh, you know, even local farmers um, are, are moving to the cities, they're taking jobs in factory, factories. So everybody's life is improving in China, and as long as it stays like that, I think the Chinese will, uh, can tolerate you know, this sort of a huge economic gap. We hear that, for example, a great many North American companies and European companies that had gone offshore to China to produce goods are now going onshore again, basically bringing those jobs back to North America or Europe because the labor costs have increased so dramatically and put together with time travel and time zone difficulties, they find it just easier to manufacture at home. But they cite an increase of 15-fold in the average wage of the Chinese person. Is, is that true? Um, 
Chinese wages are certainly going up. I mean, you can see that in the last couple of years. You know, I should mention, though, as I just said, you know, I was traveling in more rural, central, western China. Yes. And, I mean, it's a huge country. And people, I think, in the West don't really realize how much the regions within China are competing. So I spent about uh, five days with a group of Americans, a trade delegation from Silicon Valley. We were in this uh, city called uh, Xi'an. It's an old, ancient capital in central China. And uh, the, the bureaucrats, the Chinese officials in Xi'an, they weren't competing against the United States or German workers or Japanese workers. They were competing against, you know, workers in Shanghai, in, you know, in Guangdong. So there's huge competition. And I think what you'll start to see is a lot more manufacturing and jobs also shifting to really rural areas of China where there's massive population uh, and a lot cheaper land, a lot cheaper workers. The Communist Chinese regard religions as superstition. Is that an accurate statement? I wouldn't say that. I mean, the Chinese are certainly superstitious, but um, I don't know if they... Well, they certainly don't encourage religious beliefs, the communist regime. To what degree are they trying to suppress either Christian or Falun Gong or other religious organizations? Well, I, you know, again, I think, you know, from afar, Chinese looks like this monolithic state. Um, but actually, when you get inside China, you really realize how diverse it is and how, you know, the local, provincial, and municipal officials are often, you know, really controlling, you know, regulations of religion. So, for instance, in Xinjiang, which is the westernmost province, which is half Muslim, there's, you know, enormous controls around religion where uh, students cannot even, um, you know, say their prayer on college campuses. They're not encouraged or forbidden to even go to a mosque off campus. Uh, versus, you know, there are other provinces uh, in China that I visited where actually the uh, local, you know, Communist Party Mandarin actually invited Western missionaries to come to his town to help with economic development. Uh, so, you know, huge differences. Big country. <laughs> Absolutely. An enormous country. And, you know, the religious freedoms have opened up in China, but, I, you know, I should say that the Chinese government is certainly worried about, um, you know, the religious organizations being independent, and that's why there are a lot of controls and regulations. But, you know, many of the missionaries that I talked to, you know, felt that things were, were opening up. Mm -hmm. The Horse That Leaps Through Clouds, A Tale of Espionage, the Silk Road, and the Rise of Modern China. We better figure this country out, China. Uh, because they're, they're going to be the world power economically in the next 20 to 25 years. Many people believe that they will surpass the United States in economic output.